introduce our next panel, which is on uh, oncology. And it's all, always one of the most exciting panel of, the, of this annual event. And this year we have a prototype biopharmaceutical leader and a very old colleague and friend of mine, Elise Rison, who will be moderating the panel. Um, I've known Elise since uh, my day one in industry, which is in 2001. Elise has served in leadership roles that have focused on delivering medicines to patients at Merck, at EMD Serono, and most recently at Celgene. Elise is now CEO of her own biotech company, Tectonic. And I'll tell you, Elise, when I first met you in um, the summer of 2001, when I was interviewing for my first position in industry at Merck, I was inspired at what a physician scientist could be in industry. And I'll also admit that I was a little bit intimidated by, by you at the time. So with that said, I'll hand it over to you and you can introduce your great panel. Thank you, Andy. I think I've heard other versions of that story from you as well, but that's for another time. So um, good morning from the West Coast, and I am thrilled to be able to uh, moderate this, this uh, panel. I think it's going to be an incredibly um, engaging panel if it's anything like the rehearsal that we had, which was supposed to be half an hour and we had to cut off after 60 minutes. So with that, we really have a wonderful and varied panel today. I'm going to let everybody introduce themselves really, really briefly. We'll start with you, Sam. Hi, I'm an immunologist. I founded Imclone and have a number of cancer drugs on the market like Herbitux and Cyramza. I then founded other companies like Mira and uh, uh, Cadmon, and I'm now the chairman and CEO of Equilibre. Carrie. Sure. Hi, I'm Carrie Brownstein. I'm currently the chief medical officer at Selectus, a gene editing and cell therapy company in New York. And I'm previously a pediatric oncologist um, who worked at a number of companies. And I had the pleasure of meeting Elise about two years ago, and she's been a wonderful mentor, and I'm really thrilled to be here today. So thanks for inviting me. And uh, Vivek. Hi, I'm uh, Vivek Ramaswamy. I'm the uh, founder and uh, executive chairman today of Roy Vent Sciences, and uh, glad to be part of the panel. Bruce. I'm Bruce Chabner. I'm uh, originally at the National Cancer Institute for a number of years and then at Mass General and then had the pleasure of working with Elise at uh, EMD Serono. And uh, Philip. Hi there, I'm Philip Larson. I'm the global head of re research and early development at Bio um, Pharmaceuticals. Great. All right. So Let's start in keeping with the meeting theme, which is from N of one to N of a billion to talk about cellular therapy, uh, which we are clearly now more closer to the N of one than we are to N of a billion. So what is it gonna take and what do you think the advances are really gonna be that makes cellular therapy more accessible to more patients in more tumor types? And how close are we with off-the-shelf therapy or other new innovations? And maybe, Carrie, we'll, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, thanks for that question, Elise. You know, I think you're absolutely right. The autologous cell therapy space has really been an N of one situation where companies and the, uh, even the academic centers are making bespoke therapy for individual patients. And it's been working mainly in hematologic malignancies and has not really seen much yet in the world of solid tumors. And I think, um, you know, what we're doing here at Selectus with gene editing and making off the shelf allogeneic products is really going to be the revolution when we get there in that this is the only way we're gonna be able to make cellular therapies available and um, economically available to larger proportions of patients throughout throughout the world. So I think we're getting there. I think it's still um, still somewhat early days, but I do think that um, there's been significant progress and I'm sure I'd love to hear what other people's thoughts are, but there's so many companies now working in this space where we're using healthy donor cells to make large scale batches of cellular therapies that then can be available to so many more patients. And the data, while it's still early, are incredibly encouraging and I think show that at least in the space of hematologic malignancies right now, that the off the shelf versions of these therapies can be um, as effective, if not potentially more, we'll, we'll see how that goes um, and be available in the near future to more people. 
Anyone want to comment on the data with, that was shown by uh, FATE at ASCO with NK cells and whether you think that they may be as effective as CAR-T, safer than CAR-T, will you get the durability? Anyone have a view on that? Yeah, I, I just... Go ahead, Phil. Okay, well, at least my perspective is, is probably um, uh, safer from the perspective that the, the risk and, and the, the toxicity you need to manage when using T cells is um, somewhat uh, unpredictable and would probably require um, more T cells, especially if you go into solid tumor therapy, uh, whereas the NK cells, based on the data we've seen so far, seems uh, as a safer bet. But obviously, um, the challenge here would be, can you have a sustained efficacy and will you actually be able to have a lasting effect or would the effect exhaust? And I think that's one of the, one of the issues we'll, we'll have to understand better before we can say NKs versus uh, T cells. Yeah, and I, I'm of the school where it may have to be both. We know that the cytokine mm -hmm. IL-15 is such a critical cytokine in uh, uh, the oncology uh, uh, field. And I believe that what it does very beautifully is expand both NK as well as CD8 T effector memory cells. And therefore we may see in the future a convergence of both. Wow, I can't even imagine the manufacturing um, complexity. No, no, that's a whole other story. And the cost. Mm -hmm. How about for solid tumors? Um, there have been some recent setbacks, especially with some safety issues. Um, the TME has been brought up as, as one of the major obstacles. Do we think that we're making headway there? How many years away are we um, from cellular therapy and solid tumors? Well, there's certainly a lot of experiments going on clinically. I, I know there's a thyroid uh, CAR T that's now in the, in, uh, in the clinic, and uh, our people are putting in a, a, a glioblastoma directed CAR T. Um, but the question is whether you can really get an effective and uh, selective response without killing normal tissue, and, and what, right. what will the antigen be? So I think there's a lot of work to be done there. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the solid tumor space is incredibly challenging, but I do think it's surmountable. Um, I think that to your point, Bruce, I 100% agree. The hard thing with just about everything other than lymphoma and myeloma is the fact that most targets are expressed also on normal tissues that you actually need as opposed to B cells. So finding those targets so you can selectively you know, have a CAR T or other type of cellular therapy that is going to... Um, selectively um, uh, hit your tumor is going to be is incredibly challenging. That said, there are other mechanisms that I think people are working on. You know, there are the TCR type of therapies, which might be more specific if we're trying mm -hmm. to, there's also some gating strategies that some companies are using that might be helpful as well. So I think there's ways um, going forward. I think the other piece of the puzzle is, as you pointed out, the tumor microenvironment and the incredible, you know, the, um, um, issues with getting over um, the, what's going on in the microenvironment. And I think, again, with gene editing, hopefully, if all of this can be sorted out, you know, being able to secrete cytokines and other inhibitors so you can overcome some of the, the obstacles um, in the tumor microenvironment may be a way of getting cellular therapies into the tumors and potentially getting them into the tumors selectively as opposed to normal tissues. So there's lots of strategies out there. It's just going to take a lot of work um, mm -hmm. to get there. Uh, and also, we have the issue of it being much closer to an N equals one than to the uh, million. It is tough. And so... Uh, one, of, one of the advances that potentially could get us closer, I think, to N and the million, and that would, have, that would really substantially um, uh, make the manufacturing less complex are some of the companies that are starting to now form around in vivo car where you basically use either a virus or another vector mm -hmm. to, um, to actually like make the car in vivo. And I think, I don't know, do people think there's any hope of that? And how long will it take for us to get there? Uh, I think we're a long ways away. 
I think that in vivo gene editing and uh, putting viruses in that are specific enough is a whole other uh, world. And look, you know, Steve Rosenberg has been doing work with Tills for a very long time, very pretty work, and yet it's closer to an N equals one than an N of a million. So let's switch to um, other topics in oncology. You know, the last decade, cellular therapy aside, has been just such an incredible decade of innovation in oncology. Um, it's just been phenomenal on so many different fronts. So we're, I'm curious from all of you, um, based on AACR and ASCO, what do you think's most exciting going forward? I don't know, Vivek, we haven't heard from you yet. You wanna start? Well, I mean, most exciting is is a uh, you know is an absolute statement, but it may be something that we haven't talked about in a direction that I think is exciting and kind of goes to your question about solid tumors. And that yes, part of the reason why we're not going to maybe see the same promise in solid tumors in the near term for cell therapy is because of some of the inherent challenges we just discussed. But some of it may also be due to the promise of other approaches outside of cell therapy mm -hmm. in addressing solid tumors and the opportunity cost of of entering. Or, or planning a trial may actually have to be wet, measured against the best available approaches elsewhere. So there's an optimistic side to it too. I, I kind of am I'm pretty optimistic in particular about the promise of targeted protein degradation and the advances that we have seen in being able to take this from being a, you know, I, I call it a new modality, a new, a new modality of therapeutics that now is moving from just having degraders that target the active site, which was sort of 1.0 of the ProTac degrader revolution to actually realizing the promise of targeting binding sites on the target protein that go beyond the active site, which actually opens up the druggable landscape far beyond just degrading something by sticking to the same binding sites as an inhibitor. That's where version 1.0 is right now, but, I'm, but we're seeing a lot of companies be able to make the transition to actually find new binding sites on proteins. You know, I, I know we're planning possibly to have a discussion about KRAS, but I think that not only with respect to KRAS, but with respect to a whole range of previously difficult to drug or undruggable proteins. This is, I think, one of the exciting areas for solid tumors and, and all tumors to, to come. So, uh, you know, that, that's what I would say. It's an optimistic note. When we look at this, it's, it's a little bit like a hydraulic pump system where if we press on one place and it becomes a little more difficult, cell therapy with respect to solid tumors, you know, the opportunity pops up, you know, elsewhere. And, and we have to look at these things in the conduct of investigators looking to pursue trials in a given patient population. It's a measurement against the opportunity elsewhere and that's part of what part of the reason why i think we won't see as much advance in the near term with respect to uh you know cell therapy and solid tumors is because we have great opportunities to look at therapeutic advances elsewhere the, the nice part of this is that uh we have good clinical examples of these things working so we know that uh, you know this is this is a very plausible therapy now uh, practical therapy but uh, um, designing it for specific protein targets is, is, mm -hmm. is the challenge, not killing people in the process. Yeah. yeah, I think Bruce is right. It, the challenge is specific targets. And the, the interesting thing will be how we use them clinically and how we put together combination therapies that make sense uh, from the point of view of specific uh, tumors. That's no, going to yeah. be a big problem. I, I, if you think about RAS, maybe Vivek can talk to this a bit, but if you're trying to degrade RAS, how do you protect normal tissue which depend on RAS? Right. So let me, we, we've got a question coming in from Syed uh, Cosme. Let me turn it over to Syed that's related to what you were just talking about, Bruce. Syed, you're on mute, Syed. Take yourself off mute. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, thanks, Liz. Um, yeah, so sort of related to what just Vivek uh, and Bruce uh, mentioned. I mean, we know that the approval of Lumacros uh, has, has really opened the door to a new field in cancer development. But, um, you know, if you look at what may happen from here on, what was your perspective on the future of this field, especially in the context of developing resistance to KRAS agents? So as Vivek pointed out, our follow-on new compounds with dual activity of target inhibition and degradation, the answer, I mean, potentially combinations may be considered, but 
what can we learn from CKIT in, in gastric cancer or BRAF, MEC in melanoma um, to, to further improve on KRAS therapies? Well, I can comment a bit on this because it's really part of the whole story of targeted therapies where mm -hmm. the mechanisms of resistance may be somewhat different between agents, but in general involve mutations in the target or, or uh, mm -hmm. amplification of the target or, or uh, development of alternative pathways. And all that is known to happen experimentally with KRAS inhibitors. And the question is how much of that we'll see. And I'm sure we will. I mean, the response rates in the clinic are now 35 to 40 percent. They're not 100 percent. Mm -hmm. These disease control only lasts uh, several months. So, you know, we have a long way to go with KRAS, and I, I think the answer is is either better agents, but also uh, agents addressing some of the specific mechanisms of resistance, particularly alternative pathways and combination therapies. Also, mm -hmm. I think we mentioned that earlier. So. There's a long way to go with KRAS in terms of making it really an effective therapy at this point. It's, it's a marvelous uh, advance, but you know, it's early. Long way, yeah. Yeah. And I think you're already seeing companies start to have extensive combination yes. programs, mm -hmm. combinations yes. with SHIP2, yeah. EGFR, anticipating the type of resistance yeah. that everybody yeah. knows is either happening yeah. already or will happen with treatment. Yeah. You know, the, the, the example with. Yeah, we had an example with uh, BRAF where the combination with a MEK inhibitor made a huge difference in yeah. terms of duration of response. And the same thing could happen. I mean, it's really the same pathway, but maybe a little it's, more complex. Yeah, and, it, and, uh, and Bruce is absolutely spot on. It's really the same pathway. And a lot of these things are part of a network that uh, bypass uh, uh, mutations in an incredible way. So what uh, uh, we need to do is figure out ways to make sure that we know what's going to happen when we hit KRAS or when we hit EGFR, et cetera, mm -hmm. and right. how to use uh, uh, the different networks to bypass effective therapies. And that's going to be very, very important. We knew that in the infectious disease world, at least. As you know, Absolutely. we it very quickly with viruses. Yeah. I, I was just going to maybe point out, you know, a couple of, probably a couple of obvious points to people who are on the panel, but maybe worth stating anyway, is you know, the, what we've seen in KRAS, despite the celebration of, I think, some important breakthroughs in the you know, so-called G12C, that they're relatively short duration responses to date. And, and there might be, there might just be too many escape mutations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that there's kind of a couple of axes. One is, binding to on and off form. And then the other is, is sort of to be able to go pan KRAS mutant while also sparing wild type, which are of course inherently you know, in, in tension mm -hmm. with one another. So, so if we think about a couple of those axes of, of you know, really? down, unbound or on versus on and off state both, while also being able to hit pan mutant while sparing wild type, that's definitely a tough cat Very. to skin. I think that, you know, a couple of points that I would make on the mutation, escape mutation points is it, we, we probably serve ourselves well to have a clear eye lens to the different kinds of escape mutations, right? There's, there's mutations that have, that may be outside of the target protein of interest, maybe outside of KRAS, but in the pathway, then there are mutations right. actually specific to the protein itself. And I think what approaches we take, you know, combination therapy versus not depend on which class of, of, of escape mutation or escape mutation even as it applies to the pathway, even if not to the protein, you know, I think that, that those are just framing comments, but I think that the implications of directions that you might see as more promising or not depend on which of those you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Which I think, uh, the, the fact, I think all of the above will occur, which I think will speak yeah. to mm -hmm. the fact that it's going to get really into precision medicine, which for mm -hmm. each patient, you're going to have to understand what those escape mutations yeah. are or what pathways to target the next round of therapy. For them. Yeah, but, but I, I mean, way sure. back when, Elise probably remembers way back when, well, I mean, or, or maybe she doesn't, that Ed Skolnick tried to play with a RAS inhibitor at, at Merck that everyone had huge, you know, felt huge promise for. And yet, it wasn't something that was going to work because every cell, as Bruce said, 
was going to be affected and it was a disaster uh, uh, down the line. Uh -huh. And then we learned that, you know, uh, you know, inhibitors of EGF receptor bypassed uh, uh, functionality with KRAS and with SARC. It's complicated, but we're going to figure it, it out. Yeah. Well, it, it, I think the, the message is that, uh, you know, performing translational research in patients receiving these drugs is very important. Yeah. And, and this is something that we were unable to do with chemotherapy, but now we have many more tools for doing this. And this is, this is essential in, in learning about how to make this work. Yeah. But I, I think, think so there are too. some positive... There are, Philip, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, there are some positive um, learnings from, um, you know, other mutated oncogen, uh, sort of oncogenic signaling molecules, for instance, you know, the Intrac family, where you, yeah. if you address very specific mutants, you can get an extremely high response rate and, and yet have yeah. a very, very good tolerability. So I, I think, you know, being an optimist, I, I think there's reason to believe that you will be able to find chemical matter that really addresses the mutants or mutants interacting with other uh, players like BRAF and, and what you already mentioned. Uh, so I, I think, you know, it is possible uh, because there are other yeah. examples of precision molecular oncology that really works out. Maybe, um, you know, it's not a single patient, but and a reasonable handful of patients who would benefit from that. Let me, um, I'm going to take one more question right now before we go to the next topic from the audience. Uh, Philippe Lopez Fernandez, you've got a question. Yes, hi, Alice. Uh, a question to you and your panel. Uh, there, there are now several ADCs on the market with strong results. And uh, I'd like to, uh, to know what, where do you see the best possibilities to further improve ADCs to significantly uh, boost efficacy and safety? Would you go multi-specific or multi-payload or in contrary, try to be more targeted or specific? It's, you've hit some of the, the important points. I think also mm -hmm. understanding linker technology has, has been so important mm -hmm. in this field because uh, without a, a linker that's, that's uh, degradable within lysosomes but stable outside you get into a lot of clinical toxicity we still have clinical toxicity with these drugs they're, they're not uh they're not as specific as we would like uh but also defining the right payload so the, you know, there uh, recently have been some very nice uh examples of uh radionuclides attached to antibodies mm -hmm. that are working yeah. prostate cancer and and uh right. Uh, they're not antibody linked. Well, some of them are. Others are linked they are. to just uh, receptor proteins. But uh, the you know that's another uh, really interesting possibility. I think one of the things I've thought about though, with and you brought it up, Philippe, and that is that uh, we it's really hard to expect single single entities to cure cancer, uh, single single therapeutic modalities. So I think. With all of these, ultimately, we're going to reach combination therapies, perhaps mm -hmm. with immunotherapy, perhaps with chemotherapy, uh, perhaps with multiple ADCs in order to, to really achieve long-lasting effects. And I think one of the great things, and Bruce, uh, again, uh, um, is, is absolutely correct, it's going to be combination modalities, and the oncology field has always played in the combination uh, uh, modality fashion. I think uh, uh, that ADCs are tough, but we've already seen great examples of, of real responsivity in the HER2 field. Uh, there's responsivity in other areas. I believe that there's greater responsivity, again, in the hematological area than there is in the solid tumor area. We still have to learn to navigate that. It is not an easy uh, uh, road mm -hmm. to navigate, but it's going to be one that's necessary. But I believe mm -hmm. that in the hematology field, we've seen great results and in breast cancer. Yeah. And I think we're starting to go beyond that. Um, you've mm -hmm. got some of Daiichi Sankyo's new ADCs. Right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. It really mm -hmm. looks yes. like they've mm -hmm. got a lot of promise across a wide way mm -hmm. of solid tumors, TROP2 and, and other mm -hmm. drugs. Yeah. So, you know, this, this Actually, is a new they're, field, they're, really. Yeah. 
There, yeah, there was one one trial yeah. at the um, at the recent ASCO meeting that perhaps did not get as much attention as I think it truly deserves was uh, Novartis trial with um, the uh, lutetium label PSMA right. antibody, right. which which actually, to that. which actually yeah. shows you that you can get a fairly decent response in patients, oh, yeah. you know, who have tried everything. And right. what is yeah. remarkable is that the tolerability for that modality seems yeah. to be yeah. pretty good, at least compared to the ADCs. Yeah, um, it, so the HER2 story is really interesting that uh, the antibody that Sam was talking about works mm -hmm. against cells which have downregulated the expression mm -hmm. of HER2. Mm -hmm. so Amazing. You know, right. Right. Yeah, it's just. So it's, let me. Let, I'm gonna. I'm gonna cut us off for a second because there's still a few topics and and we don't have a lot of time left. Let me switch to the following, which is great successes, fast development in oncology. What can other fields take away from what's been done in oncology? Vivek, you want to start with this one? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that uh, you know, I think that we can't. You know, this is a little gauche to sort of say, but I do think that. I do think that there is a lesson to be learned and, and a discussion to be had amongst the people who aren't on this call at the FDA, who uh, I think ought to learn the lessons that came from being, you know, I think a little bit more permissive and leaning ahead on when evidence supported the use of biomarkers to be able to support approvals, to be able to decide where one trial was requ required rather than two, where the risk benefit trade-off for patients yeah. was, you know, ultimately in favor of making a therapeutic mm -hmm. available. This was a, an individual at the FDA who made a value judgment that I think you know, wasn't necessarily made with the calculus of saying that that's going to unlock an innovative revolution in the private sector, though it did have that, impact, that, though, though it did have that effect. But it was individually on a case-by-case -case basis, this was what made the most sense for this compound taking patient interests into account. And I think that you know, I think people at, at, in other divisions of the FDA can, um, you know, I think can take inspiration from that. And I think that, yes, there are a lot of lessons that we ought to talk about in terms of thinking about trial design, the better use of biomarkers to be able to select patients for the right kinds of trials that, you know, we ought to learn as lessons too. But if there was one pan industry, pan sector lesson to take away, I, if I had to pick just one, uh, I would love to see other division heads at FDA take, in, take the same inspiration that, uh, from, from Pazder as, you know, maybe others have more controversially recently in the case of, of let's just say, aducanumab's approval, which, I, which I, I think maybe we ought to talk about at some point, but I think could be a red herring and a smoke screen that distracts us from actually a valid discussion that we still ought to have from other division directors who can more constructively and in a more applicable way take some of those same lessons that Pazder led the way with. Any other comment? I, I, I think that I would say there's great lessons that can be applied, you know, for instance, doing studies with uh, if you've got an indication that has a low placebo response, as you do in mm -hmm. cancer, where you can look at multiple indications and in single arm studies looking mm -hmm. for signals. I think that you can do that. Mm -hmm. I think there are places where maybe oncology can learn from other fields mm -hmm. um, and safety and dose finding. I yeah. think are probably mm -hmm. those. And I think you've seen the FDA start to go in that direction. As we right. move away from chemotherapy as the sole mm -hmm. treatment in cancer sure. where maximal tolerated you know, dose was the way of doing it, maybe a push mm -hmm. towards really trying to find the optimal dose. And I don't know, before we go to the last topic, if anybody wants to comment on that aspect of it. Uh, I, I, yeah. I think there are ways to accelerate, I, especially, you know, uh, understanding uh, PK uh, better uh, for some of the new generation of molecules that are not either cytotoxic or genotoxic, where you can really, you know, hit the ground running by optimizing your understanding of your molecule, uh, even in healthy volunteers before you go into mm -hmm. patients, because it's so so much easier to recruit these people. And, and then you can have a much better understanding of where to start your dose when you go into cancer patients. Uh, that's, that's an under, I would say, uh, that's an under evaluated and underutilized uh, way of uh, accelerating your first in patient, I believe. Yeah. I, I, I'd I also one thing point I out, yeah, I okay. point to one short point, and that is that uh, we had a real problem with our original targeted drugs, and they weren't getting into the CNS, and we've learned to, 
to get mm -hmm. drugs in that have been very effective in some of the lung cancers and breast cancer patients, but particularly in lung cancer. Um, I think that's a lesson for the people that are interested in CNS disease. I was just going to add. I, I, I was just, just going to add one other. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to add one additional point. I think is, and this is somewhat controversial, but the idea of surrogate endpoints, or what actually, maybe not even surrogate, but what actually are the endpoints that are meaningful. And I think that one of the challenges is in oncology is survival has been the only meaningful endpoint for a very, very long time. And then there's surrogates of survival. But is that really what all drugs need to be achieving in oncology? Is that really the only thing that's important? And I'm not sure that's, that is. And I think that that's something that needs to be uh, worked through a bit. I mean, Carrie's so right about that. Yeah, but we totally agree. Really understand what surrogates mean. So sometimes mm -hmm. surrogates are perfectly good to get a drug approved and not perfectly good for the patients as far as outcome is concerned. And then other times they are. So we have to learn that in, in what is translational medicine. As Bruce said, okay. you know, I'm always, you know, suspect when somebody says, look at these animal studies because I view each human being as an inbred strain of mouse and it is very different. So we have to really try and understand how to do translational medicine, what quickly uh, we, lessons to be learned in our adaptive design models that we use in oncology, how to use them right across the board in other indications and how to try to understand and converge all of these things so we can be better at getting drugs to patients. Yep. Okay, last topic, and, and hopefully um, our sponsors are gonna let us go a little bit over since we started late, because I know this is a topic that everybody want wants to talk about. Cost and access in oncology. How do we increase access, decrease costs while stir, still spurring in a, important innovation in the field. Who wants to go so, first? Well, I'm gonna go first on that because it's <laughs> near and dear to my heart. Uh, and I argue with Peter Bach about it uh, at Memorial all the time. I believe that we're going to be running into a headstorm of, uh, of, of different types of people, patients, legislators, even the agency as to what we can charge and how we do it. But I have a point of view about this that is the following. When we see that drugs give us a three month survival edge or a seventh month edge or a one month edge and they get approved and people say, but it only did this. When we look at that data, what we understand is that X amount of the patients really survived, 20%, 15%. They were the responders. They lived for years or longer. The rest just didn't respond. And so what we need to start thinking about in a very, very thoughtful way is charging for when it works. And if we do that, no one's going to be angry about what we charge. They're going to be our allies because we're going to be showing that in 15% of the patients, they respond forever or at least for years, and we have a real change in outcome for populations. That's who we need to charge uh, uh, for, uh, and that's what our partners in, in the paying field will be happy about. And so if we do that, we will change the paradigm for how we look at what we're charging, the amount, and uh, uh, when we do it. It'll be a new world, and that's what we need to do. Although, Sam, I think some of those uh, payment-type strategies are already happening in Europe. Yes, the are. other mm -hmm. thing is there's a little bit of a natural way that that happens anyway, except for CTLA-4, where it's you know only given a couple of times and you pay up front. For most of these therapies, it's mo the monthly yeah. cost. And so if you fail fast, it costs much less yeah. than for those patients who go on for, for prolonged periods of time where the payments continue. Well, except, so except for the fact that there's some patients that will live longer, keep getting drug, 
even though the drug isn't having an effect, true. the patient is living longer. We've got to look at real responsivity in patients. Yeah. In cancer, I think the other answer to this, though, is, is better patient selection. I, you know, I, I think we're, we're failing in that regard now. Uh, if you look at checkpoint therapy, we just have very crude ways of trying to select yeah. patients uh, with PDL one maybe, but uh, you know we, we don't know what the antigen is that the tum the tumor the patient's uh, immune system is responding to. If we could select patients for specific therapies better, we, we would be uh, that would make a big difference. The the other big problem though is that sixty percent of the world can't afford our drugs. 70%. I mean, you know, cancer, we design these exotic therapies, which are so expensive for an American and Western European population, and maybe Japan and maybe China, but uh, the rest of the world can't afford it. And it's really a sad situation where, you, you know, in Africa, we're stuck now with trying to get chemotherapy to patients, let alone immune therapies and targeted drugs. I, I wanted Vivek, to Vivek, just... Vivek, I'm going to ask you a question because you think in a very innovative way and try to do things differently. Are there ways that we're not, industries not using to decrease the costs of drug development? Because obviously the, the costs afterwards are related to the costs that go into drug development. What more can we be doing there? Yeah, so I, I, um, I just want to take an opportunity to offer one joinder on the last comment, then I'll, then I'll, then I'll come back and I'll, and I'll leave that to answer your, your point, Elise, which is, I think in, this, in the space of oncology, it's an obvious point, but I don't think enough people recognize the fundamental dilemma. I agree with everything Bruce said about patient selection, but there's a basic difference between the drug pricing dilemma in something like a cure for chronic hepatitis C virus and a cure for a particular form of cancer, and it's this. It's that when you cure chronic hepatitis C, you're actually saving the system money downstream. That when that person, that person was going to live a long life anyway, but was going to go on and live a longer life that resulted in potentially really expensive downstream therapy, that even intervention that wasn't, that wasn't pharmacotherapy, in the form of liver transplants at the limit, liver cirrhosis, you know, hepatocellular carcinoma which of course then raises oncology related costs of its own. And I think the difference in curing cancer is that you are actually making people live longer without actually that, that future mm -hmm. cost saving downstream. And that's part of the point. And I think that in some ways in the oncology pricing debate, that is a, a basic fundamental point that we just are gonna have to make a value judgment around that I think we can, I don't think say we're hiding from it about patient selection, those are important tactics. But I think it, it, it sort of evades a, a fundamental dilemma at the heart of oncology drug pricing, as opposed to hepatitis C cure to therapy pricing, yeah. for example. So Vivek, uh, I just, uh, so Vivek I, I must, uh, you know, I, I must say that in some cancers, as we're now using immunotherapy in positive ways in non-small cell lung cancer and in melanoma and in other cancers, those people are going back to work those people are living lives. So they may not downstream have uh, a high cost because of a liver transplant, but they are now part and parcel uh, uh, of uh, going back to work in society. And way back when, when Amgen first uh, uh, priced erythropoietin, they used as a pharmacoeconomic model the fact that people that were undergoing uh, 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 kidney dialysis were going back to work the next week, paying taxes, making money, and being part and parcel of uh, uh, society in a positive way. Yeah, I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm not disagreeing with that. I, I, that is very that important. Is on the side of, mm -hmm. of greater cost pressure in oncology or not, but I do think that we owe it to the discussion to have a clear eyed view of what the fundamental difference is about drug prices. Uh, absolutely. But I, absolutely. But one other thing to point out, though, I think is important, and we're not going to be able to talk about this with the limited time, but it's the cost of the drug development itself. Mm -hmm. And I think so. that, you know, that's a huge yeah. whole other complicated factor. So to the point of trying to get things to people all over who can't afford it, or maybe there's no business case, for example, and some companies won't even bother developing something because there's no business case to the point of these things is I just wanted to bring up with pediatrics, for example, there's never a business case and therefore nobody wants to develop drugs and now they just have to. And I think that there's a challenge. It's because it costs more to do the studies 
than it's going to do you're ever going to make back so how do we fix the whole model of drug development such that you can actually price drugs in a way that are affordable and that's i don't know the be, answer i'm gonna that's, uh, give that's me that's the fda also <laughs> so we should have a whole discussion next year on what carrie just brought up that is a 40 minute <laughs> yep. panel and with that i know we're out of of time now. I want to thank everybody so much for the engaging conversation. I don't know if I'm turning it back to Andy or Karun. Andy. Well, it, it was supposed to be Karun, but I want to step in and thank you, Elise, and this panel. Really just an incredible discussion. And it's, you know, the, the so rich and not surprising given that 40% of the molecules in the aggregate pipeline of industry fall into this space. Um, it's also the space where, as you all have mentioned, we see the most progressive science, the most progressive policy and regulatory frameworks, but also the space where we see the greatest number of failures. So we still have a really long way to go. And at least the last thing I'll say is you did a great job in moderating this panel. And up until the very end, you were able to keep our beloved Sam Waxall in check until you got into pricing and access. And then then Sam then Sam went on to the show. That's why we did pricing last. <laughs> Thank you all very much. And I will turn it Thank to you, Karun. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Uh, what do I tell you? I, you had it very well. And uh, no, Sam is, is a good sport. Like he doesn't mind. He's got deep knowledge. But I think we need to have another summit where only we have one speaker, which is Sam, and we have listened to for the entire day. So uh, can you please put the poll slide? The poll is starting. Uh, the question is, what innovation will have the biggest impact on increasing access to cell therapies? 16. Start the poll. Welcome back, everybody, and thank you very much for participating in our poll. A, a big thanks again to Elise Rison and a, just a, an absolutely terrific oncology panel. It's such an exciting area of science, policy, um, and, and really leading edge. Uh, before we go to the next panel, if I could please ask you to put up the results of our polling question. Terrific. Thank you very much. So the question that you all took on, and we've got an, an, another neck and neck answer. What innovation will have the biggest impact on increasing access to cell therapies? And there were two answers that came in essentially tied. One was simplified manufacturing processes. And the second is the successful development of allogeneic cell therapies. So thank you again very much for participating in the poll.